Hi, my name is Amy Cooper, and I am the uh, Senior Director for R&D Operations. I'd like to introduce the speaker next, which is Linda Lubin Thompson. And we recognize the importance of leading productive and inclusive meetings, offering tools to ensure that everyone's best thinking is heard, valued, and contributes to reaching the best solution for the company. We welcome Linda to the stage as she is the executive coach and consultant from LT2 Leadership Development. And she's going to walk us through her talk, expanding opportunities for everyone, getting the most out of diverse teams. You know, it can really be a challenge to get the best from everyone in a problem-solving or decision-making meetings. Some people, uh, especially those in the dominant group, tend to also dominate the airtime. Others, often women and minorities, remain quiet, even if they have something to contribute, which they always do. This could be due to being ignored or talked over in the past. Um, it could be due to being introverted. It could simply be due to being on the phone instead of in the room. But what I want to do is share with you some strategies that leaders can use um, in order to make sure that everyone can contribute the best they possibly can whenever a group of people is making a plan, solving a problem, formulating recommendations, or making decisions, and how you, as a meeting leader, can ensure that this occurs. Much of my consulting practice focuses on developing high potential leaders below the executive level, especially women. Um, why is this topic important to me? You know, it's, it, I have seen so many brilliant, capable women who move from um, engineer into management and then into middle management, and suddenly they're not just having to meet with their own staff. They're having to influence and conduct meetings that take place with people from every discipline, every function, every geography, um, all kinds of needs, priorities that are different than theirs, and styles. And that's where it, has become, it becomes extremely difficult. Um, how to ensure that everyone's best thinking is heard, valued, and contributes um, is a place where I've found leaders often fail. And it's where um, why meetings are often referred to as a waste of time, because um, they can't manage. So what I've seen in coaching leaders and working with women, how come it's not coming up? There we go. You can see the themes that I hear all the time. Um, cross-functional and cross-organizational influence, holding your own in mostly male leadership teams, those are things that we're going to be talking, at least touching on today. Confidence really surprised me initially because I was working with extremely talented and effective leaders. But recent research that you may be familiar with shows that women's lower confidence may not be innate. Often it's induced by how women are treated, interrupted, talked over, ideas ignored. It would shake anyone's confidence. So, does this visual look familiar? If you're the woman in the top um, uh, picture, how are you going to get everyone's attention, get everyone involved in contributing, unearth everyone's priorities, commitments, and concerns to get the best information to make the best decision? What I know for sure, three things. One. Everyone can lead a productive, inclusive meeting. Two, it doesn't happen by osmosis. 
You have to be deliberate about it. And three, from years of working with leaders at all levels, I have found three strategies that I think make a big difference. So when we talk about meetings and think about meetings, we often think about um, meetings having a purpose. Otherwise, why get together at all? Got to have a reason for being there. We think about meetings having a structure, an agenda. But we don't often think about the concept of meetings as a place of safety, um, which is critical for everyone being able to contribute to their best ability. So these three strategies all help um, build safety into your meetings for everyone. And I want to start where I recommend all meetings that are this uh, problem solving or decision making meeting start, which is with an inclusion activity. Now, I learned about inclusion activities many, many years ago before the term inclusion was uh, associated with diversity. So an inclusion activity is very simple. It's a short activity, takes place within the first five minutes of the meeting, and makes sure that everyone is engaging in the same behavior is doing the same thing. So what I like to do is I like to ask people to write down something and then speak to it. Um, write down what you want to get out of this meeting. What do we need to do in the next hour? What are the two challenges that we're facing? Um, what's going to get in the way of us making progress? What are your concerns about the project that we're working on? Ideally, as you see, inclusion moves the agenda uh, forward. But what it does psychologically is it gives everyone the opportunity to um, feel like they have equal access to the floor. And it works whether you know about it or not. So it's perfectly OK to say, I want to start every one of our meetings with an inclusion activity so that everyone feels comfortable speaking throughout the meeting. Second strategy is simply to use objective and data-based methods to analyze options. I can't tell you the number of meetings I've been in where decision-making feels like a circular activity. Circular so that you're circling the drain is what it feels like. Um, never making progress. And working with clients, often they feel the same thing. Like we've been meeting for months, and we keep going over the same. How many of you have ever participated in groups that do that? It is the most frustrating thing in the world. But if you use objective, data-based methods to analyze your options. This is just one example, which is a weighted decision matrix. But if you clear on what your criteria are, and you agree, and you argue those out so you know what, you're, what criteria you're, you're all using, and how important each criterion is, then it becomes relatively simple to go through. I mean, it's just simple math to do the rest. How many of you have ever used a weighted decision matrix? Yeah, I found a lot of my engineering clients really like it. And of course, theirs are much more complex than my example is. But it doesn't have to be this. There are lots of tools that you can use to make sure that you are getting a, people are having something objective to evaluate against. And then finally, leverage and value differences to get the most innovative solutions. Now, you can, um, first, I want to talk about the make, making sure that you can value everybody in the room, because there are going to be people with different styles than you. Um, for our topic today, I want to concentrate on, this is, this is a model called social styles. And the, um, I want to concentrate on the assertiveness scale from ask to tell. 
because there are people find it easy to talk quickly, they decide quickly, they like to take risks, they like to take charge and control. These are our drivers and expressives. And then there are others who like to think something through before deciding, who like to take the time to ask questions to thoroughly understand all options and like to avoid what they consider to be unnecessary risks. More on the ask side, analyticals and amiables. Those are the people who um, often get talked over, often get ignored, and it's your job as le to lead the meeting in a way that where you value everyone's contribution, where you give everyone time to contribute and the space to contribute. And um, know that certain styles are more easily accepted from the dominant group. For example, drivers. Um, watch out for unconscious bias toward women and minorities who are drivers, because they could be labeled as pushy or domineering, where men are often labeled as assertive or leader-like when they're drivers. Um, or if they're expressives, women can be thought of as emotional or oversensitive instead of passionate, which is what we really are. Um, the corollary is, unfortunately, that the non-dominant team members whose most comfortable style is analytical or amiable, those people can be interrupted or ignored even more. It can become a downward spiral of non-participation. So be very careful and very aware of the, peop the different styles that are in the group that you're working with. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, this cartoon before, but it's a meeting with five men and one woman, and the meeting leader is saying, that's an excellent suggestion, Elaine. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, but it's really aggravating, too. Um, you know, I read a New York Times article recently that talked about the fact that women Supreme Court justices get interrupted by their male colleagues far more often than the men interrupt each other. So being an expert doesn't guarantee that you'll get heard. In fact, I had a, I had a client, uh, Sandrine, who was one of two women on the leadership team for um, EMEA, for Europe, for her company. And she said to me, you know, I've noticed that Michelle and I both get interrupted all the time. Well, I suggested that she and Michelle get together and stand up for each other and interrupt the interrupters and make sure that the other gets heard because frankly, if they were to do it for themselves, they would be called bitchy. But doing it for each other, doing it for someone else is much more easily accepted. So make sure that you encourage divergent views. How can you do that? Well. Make, ask people to express different opinions. You can ask for a devil's advocate. You can say, what are some other options? Always, always, always pay attention to the people who are not in the room and those who are quiet. You know, let's start with those online. Let Then we'll go around the room. Uh, it feels like a few people are talking but not everybody else, so let's give everyone a chance to speak. And finally, you know, Amy was speaking. Let's hear the rest of what she has to say, thereby giving Amy credit for the ideas she was introducing and making sure that she gets her full say. Whether you're the leader of the meeting or just a participant in the meeting, you can do these things. And all of them will help people feel safe and comfortable and valued so that they can contribute so that you all can do the best for your organization. 
Finally, in recent years, a body of research has revealed that um, a more nuanced benefit of workplace diversity is that diverse teams are simply smarter. Diverse opinions challenge the status quo. And I want to encourage all of you to start with an inclusion activity, use objective ways to make decisions, and value and elicit diverse opinions. Thanks. We have eight seconds left. Uh, I don't know, is, is there time for questions? Not really, but I'll take one. No? Heading back, back to the room here. Thanks, okay, Linda. Um, that's it. Thank Linda, you. I do have a question. Oh, okay. I'm way in the back. Um, so, um, wanted to find out from you what you felt about sending out an agenda and, and obtaining feedback in advance of doing that in the meeting where you said goal and two biggest challenges, which could take you know, more time. Um, I think that's one way to get the information. You can get that information ahead of time. I would still do something within the first five minutes um, that in, makes, engages everybody in the same behavior because the dynamics of the room will be different if you do. Um, I think it's always a good idea. In fact, what you could do is get that input from everybody ahead of time and have a slide or whatever you, um, with all that on there and then um, have people talk about what order they want to talk about it in or is there anything missing or um, anything that they could add to it. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you.